ビデオ Ain't no use lying. I'm really excited about this one. We've been through the first season of Slayers, a low budget title that, while stumbling out of the gate for the first couple of episodes and clearly held back by a recession ravaged budget, still managed to be a classic fantasy anime of the 90s. We've been through Slayers next, an exceptionally strong season that gave the series the spit and polish it oh so needed with new characters, impressive world building, and making new breakthroughs with their original cast both in terms of drama and comedy. So now we come to the final and most interesting season of the original Slayers trilogy, Slayers Try. Airing between April 4th to September 26th, 1997, Slayers Try is a very fascinating season of Slayers because it's the first season not to be based off any of Hajime Kanzaka's novels or manga. It is an entirely original project, and there's a reason for that. Slayers and Slayers Next were both very popular best-selling anime in their respective times, so naturally JC staff was commissioned by TV Tokyo to do a third season. Here's the problem. With adapting the first eight novels in the Slayer series, it meant establishing a dynamic foursome of Lena, Gowrie, Amelia, and Zelgadis that sucked themselves into the minds of Otaku. But after beating Hellmaster Fabrizzo at the end of the eighth novel, the story ends with Amelia and Zelgadis leaving the party permanently. Making a new season with only half your main cast that have come to define earlier seasons is its own uphill battle, but when those same two characters are replaced by Luke and Melina, who are far more serious than Amelia and Zelgadis, it makes sense that you would want to keep the original gang together and craft your own narrative. So Hajime Kanzaka himself and director of previous seasons Takeshi Watanabe gathered a murderous row of screenwriters and prepared to forge their own original story. Complete with a brand new setting, new party members, a darker than normal plot, morally grave villains, and some seriously bizarre humor even by Slayer standards. Oh, thank goodness. You're finally awake. It's all right now. Yeah, it's no wonder that this season is regarded as the most divisive. Out of all the three original seasons of Slayers, it is this one that stirs up the most debate. Some people love this season and think it is just as good as next, if not better. Others see it as the weakest installment of the 90s trilogy, seeing it as mostly just retreading old ground while trying and failing to hit the mark with any new ideas that it brings to the table. This divisiveness is not held by Kanzaka himself, stating in later interviews that he was dissatisfied with how the final product came out. As for me, well, I honestly don't know because, unlike the previous two seasons, I've only seen Slayers try once. I do remember liking it, but when I tried to recall specific events of the anime, my memory feels incredibly hazy, like the anime just didn't attach itself to my brain all the way. Always a good sign. So really, the goal of this video is not just getting into the specifics as to why Slayer's Try is so divisive, but to also help me form a concrete opinion of the season that isn't clouded by nostalgic memories of when I watched it almost a decade ago. You know the drill how we do these videos, summarize the plot beat by beat, and point out what makes the anime work and what doesn't. Let's roll! Now, Slayer's Try actually starts strong right out of the gate by establishing two plot points that build to an incredible premise. One is the first scene where we see Lena waking up in a hotel room and seeing an envelope that has been slid under her door. It requests an audience with her and is addressed by someone named Philia. The next is the scene afterward that sets up something that is going to be a reoccurring element throughout Try, dealing with the fallout of the events of Slayer's next. After Hellmaster's destruction in the last season, the magical barrier that was protecting people from the Slayer's world from demons like Fabrizzo and Gov was destroyed. And with those two threats neutralized, the nations are now free to travel across the sea to the outer world. There has also been a mysterious pillar of light that has shown up in the wake of the barrier's destruction. Not even five minutes in and we already have the perfect setup for an original story. A mysterious request from Lena from an unknown person, and a setup for the brand new setting outside the world we've been residing in for the past two seasons. 
After being properly reintroduced to Lena and Gowrie, who are currently in their element pigging out, they run into Zelgatus. He's here because he is considering stowing away on the peace delegation that is about to set sail for the Outer Worlds, once again hoping to find a cure for his Chimera body. And this is the only time that reoccurring plot point gets any play in this season, so just erase it from your mind for now. Lena asks Zell to accompany her and Gowrie to meet the person who sent her the letter. I am the one who sent that offer. This blonde haired beauty with the Mickey Mouse tiara is Filia Okot. We'll go more into detail about her character later, but for now, she reveals herself as the person who sent Lena the letter. Lena asks why Filia contacted her, but before she can elaborate, Gowrie, thinking that he sees a tail, lifts the back of Filia's dress to investigate like the master of tact he is. This causes Filia to clopper him with her huge mace and run off screaming. Philia ends up leaving her mace behind, and it is so heavy that Lena can't even hold it. Zell deduces that since she had that mace attached to a garter on her leg and lifted it with no problem, it must mean that Philia is no ordinary cleric. The next day, Philia shows up again, apologizes, and asks for her mace back. Lena wants to continue the talk they had the other day, but Philia says that in order to do that, they must pass a test. She then teleports away. Meanwhile, the peace delegation, headed up by Prince Phil and Amelia, is about to set sail. Lena sees Amelia and calls her name, which Amelia responds to by acting like me whenever I encounter my old high school classmates. Hey there, Amelia! Long time no see! Who are you? I don't think we've ever met before! Hey, what are you talking about? Hello, Miss Lena! Phil, what's up? But as that awkward reunion is going on, we come back to Philia, who begins the test by revealing her true form. Ah! Philia is actually a golden dragon, and she tests Lena and her friends by pretending to attack the peace delegation and see how the four of them defend themselves. And this scene is a good example of an undeniable positive quality of Slayer's Try, being that out of all the original three seasons, it is the most well animated. This is the season where the team has finally figured out how to make Slayer's look its greatest. While there are some old cheap tricks here and there, those moments are rare when compared to the previous seasons. This team has figured out how to use their budget so well that every episode has at least one Sakuga moment. Philia, gotta borrow something! What do you think you're doing? How dare you! Uh, ah! Huh? Oh. Ow! So oh. right. Slayer's Try is also the most ambitious from a director's standpoint. Watanabe does a lot with the photography and the lighting to really add on the drama, to the point that some shots look like they came out of a feature film. Anyway, Lena and the gang defeat the Golden Dragon by Lena casting her trademark Dragon Slave. Darkness beyond twilight, crimson beyond blood that flows. Buried in the stream of time is where your power grows. I pledge myself to conquer all the foes who stand before the mighty gift bestowed in my unworthy hand. Dragon! But since Philia teleports before it hits her, all it does is create a tsunami wiping out every ship in the peace delegation except the one the four of them are on and half the port town. Being that she's now in for something more than just a stern lecture, Lena decides to take the ship and steer it towards the outer world. Zell and Amelia are hesitant, but after appealing to their respective weaknesses, they eagerly come along. Amelia, you want to spread justice and fight evil there, don't you? Yeah, I do. And Zelgadis, I know you want to go. Oh yes, I'm the sort who's always looking for a thrill. And with that, our four heroes set out on their biggest journey yet. So after being adrift for a week and nearly starving to death, Lena and the gang finally make landfall. And since we have the gang back together, now's an opportune time to address one of the most reoccurring criticisms about Slayer's Try. Some have a problem with how the main group is portrayed in terms of comedy. Not that they are widely out of character for the sake of humor, but that their comedic shtick has plateaued since next. Lena is still foul-tempered, Gowrie is still a dunce, Amelia is still flighty, and Zelgatis is still the ever-patient straight man, always there to take a pie to the face like the good lord autumn bottom he is. But for this reason, many Slayers fans have taken tried to task for not evolving the humor like Next did, and just mostly returning to the old bag of tricks. I think the anime knows this because throughout the anime, characters will have these little haven't we been here before moments. I just 
just have a strange feeling we've done this all before. Oh, come on. What, are we headed for a waterfall? <laughs> Same old pattern. <laughs> Same old cheap joke. But to me, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The four characters already have an established dynamic that works well on its own, so why bother trying to reinvent the wheel? After making landfall, the gang finds the village they saw on the horizon is under attack by two beastmen. Gravos, a lizard man, and Gillis, a fox beastman. Not much to say about Gravos. He does serve as kind of the heavy for the first third of the anime, but other than that, he's pretty unremarkable aside from a good gravelly performance by the voice of Meowth, Nathan Price. Oh, what are you, some kind of idiot? Lord Valgob ordered us to use our heads, remember? And I think the writers knew he was uninteresting because they completely sidelined him after episode 10 by, no joke, having Lena send him into orbits. And though he wished for death, he was unable to die. Eventually, Gravo stopped thinking. Gillis, on the other hand, is a henchman that leaves a much larger impression. Not only does he have a great design with him being this raggedy highwayman fox, but he's also the first opponent the Slayers have that can be considered part of the Rogue class. Instead of using swords or magic, Gillis relies mostly on bombs, guns, and other crazy weaponry to get one over on the Slayers crew. And for a guy introduced as a second banana henchman, he actually comes close to beating them quite a few times thanks to his low cunning and ability to trick the team into playing against each other. But he also wouldn't be half as memorable if it wasn't for the performance of the legendary Matty Blaustein, the other voice of Meowth, who gives him a ridiculous cockney accent that is full on Hello, Gov. Boss said we got to take good care of the hostage. Here, have some. Ah! After our four heroes give the two villains a royal ass kicking, the townspeople thank them with a much needed feast. But before the heroes leave, the village elder tells them that Gravos and Gillos have been attacking surrounding villages for a while now, and that they seem to be looking for something specific. After they leave town, they run into Philia, who reveals to them that she's a golden dragon and that they passed her test. Sitting down to tea, she tells them that the reason why she needs them is because her clan had just received a deadly premonition. There shall come a controller of a dark star who shall call forth the light, and the world shall be flooded with darkness. Dragon's blood shall spread, and following the struggle between light and darkness, a single star shall be awakened. Around the star shall spin five lights, and the power shall be a darkness beyond twilight, a brilliance beyond the dawn. When the power is unleashed, we shall yield to an arrow-like force, which will split the heavens apart. Philia believes that the power between light and darkness may refer to humanity and that she has chosen Lena to be humanity's representative to save the world. Lena rejects her offer in the politest terms possible. <laughs> but lucky for Philia, she has an ace up her sleeve. What? Lena? By any chance, was your first choice's part-time job being a waitress? It was. <laughs> Lena? Lena? Miss Lena? Miss <laughs> Lena? <laughs> This letter that sends Lena into a panic is from her older sister Luna, who, even though she works as a waitress, is actually ten times the sorceress that Lena is. Shut up and do it! Sign Sis! Hmm. Oh, uh, <gasps> Sis? You mean Lena's big sister? <laughs> I'm not going to spend too much time talking about her because she's one of those characters in Slayers that is shrouded in mystery. All you should know is that the best way to get Lena to do something is the very threat of drawing her sister's ire, which she has done before. That crippling fear of slugs we saw in Next? That was Luna's doing. So after a good fearful cry, Lena decides to be humanity's savior. When someone as strong and crazy as my sister won't do it alone, one thing's pretty clear. You mean the fact that she's really scared of this? <laughs> yeah. With that, Philia tells the four of them that they must now go to her clan's temple to make it official. And since Philia is now an official member of the party, I guess we can talk about her and how she has been considered the most divisive element of Slayer's Try. 
Filius Stick is established very early in the next episode. She takes both herself and the mission very seriously, and that immediately leads into clashes of personality between her and the Slayer's gang. It's about time for us... Mm. Oh, to go to the Temple of the Fire Dragon King? Well, not quite. To find the best place in town for dessert! Alright! <laughs> this establishes Filius' main comical trait, frazzled. No, not that! Take it out. Oh, we'll be so close now! Oh. Now, me personally, I like Philia. She's funny, she's cute, especially in dragon form, and her voice actress, Tara Sands, who you might remember as the voice of Bulbasaur, can deliver a performance that can switch from calm and dignified to frantic and on the verge of tears on a dime. We break the device which absorbs magical energy. And where is that? I don't know. But the reason why people don't seem to like her, and this allegedly extends to Kanzaka himself, is that people find her to be too much of a holier-than-thou fuddy-duddy whose straight man role is made redundant by the fact that Zelgadis exists. Which is more important? Saving the world or your dinner? Hmm, I'd say my dinner. One. While I do agree that Philia is a bit snooty and does give Lena and the rest of them the business from time to time, she never struck me as holier than thou. She's really more of someone who realizes the gravity of the mission early on and is determined to get it done as quickly as possible. Second, she's not really a full-blown straight man because unlike the understated Zell, her reactions are very cartoony and become more so as the series goes on. This also allows Philia to develop traits that cause other people like Lena to play straight man to her, such as being just as easily distracted by things like Lena and being a huge crybaby if pushed too hard. And some may also have a problem with her constant presence in the party upsetting the balance of the quartet, but I don't see that problem. I mean, it worked for Zelos in the last season, so why shouldn't it work here? Speaking of... Right when the squad's about to leave town, a chill runs down Philia's spine as she detects an evil presence. It is then that Lena and the gang find out that Zelos is not only back, but has also been tailing them for the past few hours. And I love how they establish this by just having Zelos silently hang in the background for most of the episode, and we don't really get a full glimpse of him until the very end. As they restart their journey, Lena figures that Zelos' presence, what with him being a true blue demon after all, might actually be connected to the prophecy. Philia, being both a servant of the gods and part of a race that was nearly wiped out by Zelos, is a little miffed at this observation and throws a tantrum so hard she knocks herself unconscious. And at such an inopportune time because now is the time for the main antagonist of the season to introduce himself. Tell me, how was a weak little witch like you able to defeat someone as powerful as the Demon Dragon King? Demon Dragon King? Who are you anyway? Who am I? Who indeed? Instead of an introduction, I'll give you this! <laughs> Remember how I said that this season is all about them dealing with the consequences of Slayer's necks? This is one of them. Meet Valgov, Gov's most loyal and fanatical servant, and boy is he happy that he gets to kill the sorceress who defeated his master, even though that was Hellmaster Fabrizzo that did the deed and Lena was, at best, an accessory to that murder, but I doubt he cares. Make no mistake, Valgov definitely conjures up the image of the prototypical edgy bishy anime villain archetype that were starting to gain traction around that time. I mean, he even gets black angel wings halfway through the series. This guy was made for the AMVs ladies fawned over in the early 2000s. Not surprising considering he's voiced by Scotty Ray, who it turns out is quite good at that kind of role. But in spite of that, or maybe even because of that, Valgov is certainly one of Slayer's most unique baddies that has a lot more going for him than just being an evil supernatural bastard, but we'll get to that later. Valgov is about to finish off Lena, but stops when he sees that Gowry is about to pull out his Sword of Light. He tries to take it from him, but in that moment of inattentiveness, Zealous attacks him, causing Valgov to disappear. It's around this time that Philia regains consciousness and absolutely lays into Lena for hanging around a monster like Zealous. Not helped by the trickster priest, absolutely needling her throughout the conversation. Even if I did use a pretext, I'm trying to save the world from a horrible threat. It isn't like the selfish pretext a monster would use. A pretext? He is a pretext. <sighs> oh. 
And before anyone asks, no, they hate each other throughout the entire anime, and yes, they are an incredibly popular ship. Zelos, who has also been gathering intel on Valgov and his cronies, knows that they have three objectives. One, to kill Lena, obviously. Two, to steal Gowry Sword of Light, which is actually a powerful legendary weapon called Goranova. And three, to seek out a weapon similar to Goranova, but far more powerful. Anyway, after a clash with a sandworm that Gravos and Jilla summoned, Valgov once again appears, this time armed with a lance similar to Gowry's called Ragado Mezgus. The three of them end up dueling, but once Gowry pulls out Goranova, their blades end up clashing, and I'm gonna steal a joke from AMV Hell. Shit! Hate it when I get my Schwartz twisted! But suddenly, this ex death looking dude shows up and severs the connection. Lena tries attacking him, but he appears to be unaffected by magic and orders Valgov to retreat. But not before Valgov utters a few threats towards Lena. Damn you, Lena Inverse. Mark my words. I will kill you. And that, my friends, is the entire setup for the series. And if you think that's a lot of plot to take in, don't worry. It'll get crazier soon. After two filler episodes, one involving Philia being put on trial for the crime of being a dragon, and the other involving the gang turning some golden dragon ruins into a runaway train, we finally arrive at the Fire Dragon Temple. And while Lena and the gang are given a warm welcome, in spite of nearly destroying the temple in the last episode, Philia is immediately pulled into the Supreme Elder's office and has some splaining to do. Are we supposed to entrust saving the world to a bunch of people who have already wrecked part of our temple? But even after all the hell they put her through in the last couple of episodes, Filia vouches for Lena and her friends, saying that she doesn't know why, but she truly believes that Lena and her squad might have the skill and luck necessary to save the world. I don't know how to say this, but there is something that allows a person to succeed beyond mere skill. And they have that! But before they go off and actually start their journey, who should show up but that ex-death guy again? Who are you? My name is Alves. I have come from the Overworld. The Overworld? Overworld? Now, a detailed dissertation about the Overworld is easily going to get us off track for a few hours, so the short answer is that in-universe, the Overworld is the dimension above the Slayer's universe. But in the meta sense, Overworld is the universe where Kanzaka's other series, Lost Universe, takes place. Think the Slayer series, but in space. Almace explains that he has come to take the Sword of Light, and because the Supreme Elder asked him nicely, he states his motivations. What I desire is to summon the Dark Lord Darkstar to this world. Darkstar! Oh no! Spoiling things ahead of time, but for as much hype as they give Darkstar, he's not really much of a character in a way, and really just operates more as a plot device. He's more of a weapon, if anything, and is far more of a player in the Lost Universe series, where he takes the form of a spaceship that can turn into a human. The real villain of substance in the series is Valgov, and this episode makes that point perfectly clear. Up to this point, it feels like we already have a clear picture of what the journey is and who the good guys and bad guys are, but then this episode comes along and starts to throw everything and everyone for a loop. It turns out that Valgov is not just a monster, but also a dragon. He's the sole surviving member of a race called the Ancient Dragons who were genocided off the face of the Earth by the Golden Dragons of Philia's clan. It was thanks to Gov finding him that Valgov was able to have a second chance at life as a monster. This is why his desire for revenge against Lena burned so bright. And the moral ambiguity doesn't stop there, as the Supreme Elder decides to immediately cut a deal with all mates that they will hand over the Sword of Light if he'll summon Darkstar in his own world and not theirs. But after Valgov shows up and makes a mess of things, Lena decides to make a speech about how she feels in all of this. Sorry, but when it comes to selling out other people to save yourself, my policy is to prevent it. And that applies both to this world and the overworld. Did I make myself clear? A fight breaks out with Lena discovering she can actually damage all mates with the Ragna Blade, but then Valgov turns into his ancient dragon form and has the Supreme Elder start sputtering out excuses for murdering an entire race. Only one of the ancient dragons had the power of thousands of our kind. And because their violent nature was so detestable to us, the dragon race hunted them down and exterminated them. Valgov retreats once again after Zelos takes him down, and the foursome decides to start looking for the other three weapons needed to summon Darkstar before Almace and Valgov get to them first. But more importantly, 
Philia decides to tag along with them some more, this time for more personal reasons. I've got to find out for myself if the prophecy is true, and whether or not what Volgov said was true as well. Oh, Philia, a journey ahead of you will be hard indeed. You'll be sorry! You would think that now this is the point where we start going on some Weapon of the Week plot, but this is where the anime begins to start merging themes and plot together. And it doesn't get more obvious than the gang's next location, which is a kingdom of light magic and a kingdom of dark magic that have been at war with each other for centuries. The theming of this two-parter is handled well because the differences aren't just magic type based, but also ideal based. The Light Kingdom is a place of high ideals where Lena, Gowrie, and Philia are immediately thrown into prison over a misunderstanding, while the Dark Kingdom is more focused on ends justifying the means, who Queen invites Amelia, Zell, and Zelos to dinner just so she can sweet talk them into becoming assassins for her. And if you think that's too subtle for you, Zelos just spells it out for you. Alto follows the philosophy of high ideals while Baritone goes for results. So does that make Baritone here the bad guys? Oh, I wouldn't say that at all. And you can't say that following high ideals is correct either. Reality tends to demand a mixture of the two. And this theming does end up forming an important plot point. At the climax of the episode, not only do we find out that light and dark magic combined can form a powerful new form of magic, but also that same magic has the power to neutralize the dark salt weapons. It's a good thing they learned that because in the next episode, Jilla steals Gowrie's sword. Speaking of Gowrie, one criticism I can level against this anime is that despite Gowrie's sword being a huge plot device, Gowrie himself feels underutilized. We don't get any new insight as to how the sword came into his family's possession or why it became so important to him aside from being a family heirloom. All in all, the relationship between Gowrie and his sword in this season just boils down to the other characters yelling, Gowrie, how could you let them steal your sword, you idiot? Gowrie, you idiot! Moron! Octopus! Squidhead! Bait for brains! You don't have to go that far, you know. But we do get some insight on Jillis's character and why he's so fanatically loyal to Valgob. He too was a victim of attempted genocide, and it was Valgob that not only saved him, but saw him as an equal. It's good tragic insight as to what makes a lackey so loyal. Jillis ends up leading the five adventurers into Valgov's lair, and they all get separated. Lena and Gowry somehow end up stumbling across Allmace, who is currently in recovery mode from their last battle, while meanwhile, Zealous runs into Valgov, with Philia eavesdropping on their conversation, and both meetings end up dropping two big bombshells. On Lena's side, she discovers that Allmace doesn't want to summon Darkstar, but destroy it. He is a servant to the overworld goddess and Darkstar's arch nemesis, Volfie. He tells Lena the story of how Darkstar and Volfeed were locked in an eternal war, and how it resulted in Darkstar becoming the mad beast he is by absorbing Volfeed and her unstable energy. The reason why he came to the Slayer's world in the first place was because the five weapons were Darkstar's kryptonite. Over on the other end, Zealous wants to bring Valgov over to the monster race's side as he would be a very powerful asset, and is willing to do anything to sell him on the idea. Anything. If you agree to join us, then the person responsible for Lord Gov's death will be dealt with once and for all. In other words, Valgov, I shall personally see to it that Lena Inverse is destroyed. Honestly, this whole season is Zelos at his most willfully malicious. While Nex did make it obvious that he was one of the bad guys, you still kind of saw him as one of the gang because he traveled with the party and their goals often lined up with each other. In Tri, Zelos' status as one of the antagonists is far more explicit. His goals are diametrically opposed to that of Lena's party, and he spends considerably less time in the party itself, either ducking out when things get inconvenient for him, or just spending time plotting with the villains. Of course, any drama that can be wrung out of this is undercut by Lena knowing exactly who Zelos is and what his weaknesses are, and just responds to his inevitable betrayal with a few bonks to the head. Of course, Valgov refuses because he wants to kill Lena himself, so Zelos provokes him into a fight. This leads to the rest of the party finding them, and Valgov, now in possession of both Ragudo Mezigus and Goran Nova, goes, That's it! Everyone dies! Yeah, it turns out you don't need all five of the Darkstar weapons to summon Darkstar, just those two specific ones. How convenient! 
Valgov puts the two blades together, which activates an ancient device that summons everyone to the Pillar of Light where the ritual can begin. Everyone tries to kill Valgov, but none of their attacks do any good against him. Even Lena stabbing him in the heart and casting a supercharged dragon slave at his chest point blank only makes him angry. Valgov takes Vilya hostage and forces her to activate the Darkstar weapons, which opens the gate for Darkstar to come into the Slayer's world. But since the summoning also requires the sacrifice of a living being... Very well then. You can have me! <laughs> huh. Unexpected? It looks like Darkstar's summoning is inevitable, so Lena has no choice but to once again bite the bullet and try to cast the Giga Slave. World's gonna end anyway, so why not flip that coin? But right as she's about to cast that spell, all of a sudden, two figures shrouded in light come out of Darkstar's gate with the two other Darkstar weapons, Nezard, the Trident of Light, and Bodegar, the Axe of Light. The two figures plunge their weapons into the ground and are able to seal away Darkstar's gate, but the resulting explosion ends up separating Lena from the rest of the group, and she wakes up floating in the ocean, half-conscious and far away from the Pillar of Light, not even knowing if her friends and allies got away safe. This is... The perfect time to start the seasonal Wacky 4 episode filler arc! Now those of you who have been following since the beginning, you do know that these wacky filler arcs that signal the halfway point of the story is a seasonal tradition at this point. But the one in Try honestly feels a little different. With the entire season setting itself up as this darker Slayer story full of genocide and grey morality, it kind of makes sense to make the comedy a little wackier to provide a greater sense of levity and the filler arc of Slayers takes that wackiness to an 11. When the arc kicks things off with an incredibly bizarre Alice in Wonderland parody as a sort of tone setter, you know things are going to be bizarre for the next couple of episodes. Gallery! Gallery, is that you? Huh? Hey, you want an episode where Lena, Zell, and Philia get stranded on a ghost ship that has a pirate captain who is so obsessed with jars in life that he turned into one, and we find out that Philia is also obsessed with jars? They're all beauties I've dreamed of owning. No wonder he wants us to be careful. I have to price these all out. Where do I start? Do you want an episode where Amelia and Gowrie get involved in a forbidden romance between a human and a reverse mermaid while also filling this season's Force Feminized Gowrie quota? Why are you doing this to me? We need a beautiful woman to summon the guardian of the fish people's secret treasure, Mr. Gowrie. Yeah, so why are you using me? What's the problem? It said a beautiful woman, right? Besides, they gave you food and shelter, didn't they? And do you want an episode where Amelia joins a group of elderly people who see themselves as super sentai heroes? We are the shooting star! Shining in the heavens! We are the Beastmen! <laughs> Um, we're just getting further and further from the main plot, aren't we? But it's just like Gowry said. A criticism I have with this filler arc over the ones from the last season is that this filler arc feels completely divorced from the main plot. The ones from the other two seasons at least had a through line of trying to get to Cyrag or searching for a manuscript. Here, it feels more like a set of random adventures that are only held together by one party trying to search for the other. And even when they reunite, the moment is more like a, oh hey guys, you're finally ready to continue saving the world now? Which, by the way, shouldn't they all be in a bigger hurry to get back to the Pillar of Light? I know they don't have a set time limit, but the stakes just completely disappear for these four episodes. But I guess we should be thankful to get the laughs in when we can, because the next couple of episodes is where it all begins to get dark. So after four episodes of nonsense, we finally check back in with what's happening at the Pillar of Light. We find out that the four weapons of Darkstar were just enough to seal Darkstar away, but only temporarily. Almace, the other two Overworlders, and Zelos, who's aligning with them for the time being, know that in order to completely seal him, they need to find the last Darkstar weapon. At the same time, Lena and the gang travel back to Valgov's base to see if they can get back to the Pillar of Light, but find that the device Valgov used to get there is useless without a Darkstar weapon. So now they have to search for the final weapon as well. Unlike the last arc that involved a search for the Darkstar weapons, this arc is far more plot heavy and, believe it or not, actually goes somewhere. But it still keeps with the themes of heroic idealism versus getting things done, and this is best shown with the reveal of the other two overworlders. The first to get revealed is Ero Logos, who wields the Axe of Light. He is the one who does not give a damn about the lives and fates of everyone in the Slayer's universe, and just wants to save his own world regardless of the cost. A personality trait that brings him into constant conflict with Allmace, who wants to go with a plan that keeps casualties to a minimum. 
Why do you put such trifles before the greater task at hand? Because I thought the plan was to minimize collateral damage to this world, while attempting to kill Darkstar. Don't forget that our world teeters on the brink of annihilation, always. Or would you have us abandon our world to save this one? <sighs> the servants of Bolfi have indeed fallen far. The second is Sirius, who wields the Trident of Light. It's kind of kept a mystery over what Sirius believes is the best course of action regarding Darkstar, only because he stays quiet half the time. But it's through his actions that we see Sirius's philosophy. In his debut, he goes out of his way to minimize damages and casualties, and even saves a town by opening an underground river and bringing them water. His inner self can be summed up by his interaction with a flower girl who thinks he's a legendary hero. These are the prettiest flowers from my secret garden. Your hand's so big, and it's so warm, like my father's hands were. He's not as unfettered as Logos, but also more pragmatic than Almay's. He represents the balance between two forces, which I guess that's the reason why he's the sole surviving overworlder at the end of the anime, spoiler alert. Also in this arc, we find out where Jillis went in the ensuing chaos. He was found and taken care of by a small family of fox beastmen like himself, consisting of Alina and her small son Palu, both of them also carrying Cockney accents. Palu! Dinner's almost ready! All right, Mom! It almost seems like he's ready to start a new life, especially since he believes his beloved Lord Valgov is dead. But once Lena and the gang show up, his quest for avenging his lord and master kicks into high gear and he builds a goddamn missile to take them out. It fails, but the ensuing explosion ends up unearthing a mysterious pillar. Lena's party think nothing of it initially, while Jillis parts on good turns with Alina and Palu. Shortly afterwards, the battle with Sirius ends up unearthing another pillar, this time with Philia recognizing the symbol as being one of the Golden Dragons, and for some reason, shaking her to her very core. The journey leads the party into the Ashes of Ariandel DLC, where they find the temple that holds the final Darkstar weapon, Galveria, the bow and arrow of light. The temple is surrounded by a magical barrier. Philia goes to dispel it, but in the process, learns some very hard truths. You who murdered our race, who hid our remains in this land of ice? Why have you come to disturb our grave? You who became murderers in the name of the gods. Murderers? So not only was Valgov not lying, but Filia's entire clan was about the reason they committed the genocide. The Golden Dragons desired a greater power to oppose the monster race. That power lay with the one dragon tribe who did not participate in the war. We, the ancient dragons, greater power would only give rise to greater destruction. And so we sealed away this threat, despite having sealed it away. The fear we would someday unleash it grew to unstoppable strength. And the result was that those who guaranteed peace in the world ordered our annihilation. Of course, the only following Ordered's excuses might be coming sooner than we expected. What the? Golden Dragons! Well, since Zealous and the Overworlders arrive, I'm sure the dragons will say the HA! Serves you right. In order to break the seal that was created by the ancient dragons, Zealous holds Philia hostage and provokes her into casting a holy spell that he can fuse with his black magic to break the barrier. Luckily, Lena puts a stop to that, and since he's been a bit of an asshole for the past couple of episodes, Zealous is punished in a way that's oddly humorous for all the grim plot stuff that's happening at the moment. Life is so wonderful! And living is marvelous! The world's overflowing with light and joy. Uh, psychological warfare. It's common knowledge that monsters who thrive on negative human emotions can't stand it when life is praised with positive feelings. Okay, Mr. Zealous, I think you better surrender now. Oh, crap. <sighs> what an ironic end. They met the same fate as the ancient dragons. 
Lena spells it out to All Mace that even though they may have the same goals, she's not going to risk having Galveria fall into the hands of a group of people that may destroy their world while killing Darkstar. Therefore, she vows to destroy Darkstar herself and takes Galveria. Which, it turns out, being the most powerful Darkstar weapon ain't just Whistling Dixie. Light come forth! <laughs> This warning shot gets the attention of Air Logos, who decides to kill All Mace just because he didn't take Galveria from Lena sooner. You see, this is why you should not let people who aren't going to be team players on your team. And in the ensuing aftermath, Zelos, fully recovered from his awful punishment, seals Galveria from Lena and immediately leaves with Air Logos and Sirius not far behind. What? You thought Lena was just going to get the weapon needed to kill the final boss with no difficulty? Get serious. So now we're in the final stretch of the anime. And to me, it's this final battle that ties the anime together. Up until this point, the writing has felt a little meandering, especially in the first half of the series where it felt like the creative team had zero confidence in how the plot was playing out. But as the anime kept going, it felt like everything was beginning to come together, both from a story standpoint and a thematic standpoint, and it's what makes the final battle probably the most strongly written of the story arcs thus far. So after giving All Mace and the Dragons a proper burial, Philia is so wracked with guilt of what her clan did that she gives up her position as a priestess. From this day forward, I will never return to the temple. I will no longer serve as a priestess. Unfortunate. Meanwhile, at the Pillar of Light, Zealous reveals that his plan is that he is going to kill Darkstar so that Darkstar won't take the credit for what the monsters have been trying to do for the past millennia. Aerologos, being the understanding diplomat that he is, immediately tries to kill him. But Sirius steps in and says that no one can kill Darkstar alone, and all three come to an understanding that they should team up. Back at Valgov's lair, Lena and the gang end up having a final battle with Jillis, who has a goddamn tank. <laughs> you see, this tank's armored with all the hell come. Your magic won't work against it. <laughs> Dude, your talents are far needed elsewhere than some petty revenge quest. Thulia, feeling pretty much suicidal after all that has gone down for her, decides to sacrifice herself to stop Jillis. But since Jillis' tank isn't that well made, both end up surviving the ensuing explosion. Lena, having zero patience for this martyr complex BS, decides to give her a stern lecture amongst the rubble. I'll say this, I hate heroines who go for that big sad martyr stuff. <sighs> but I'll also say, you have a responsibility to keep going to the very end. Cause you belong in this world, you got that? Huh? Got it. Jillis ends up allying himself with the gang, though not entirely by choice by the by, and takes them to the Pillar of Light, which sadly is all he's good for. After this, he spends most of the final battle cowering behind some rocks and worshiping his new savior, Philia. I will protect my savior, that's common sense. Right, boss? Uh, did you call me boss? Yeah, he called you boss. Come on, anime, give him enough time and materials and he can make a Gundam for the battle against Darkstar. And they all arrive just in time because the final battle has begun. They don't waste time in talking with Zelos and the Overworlders, with both sides immediately teaming up. It's a tough battle, especially considering that Darkstar can launch a heavy and incredibly painful attack just by moving. But with all five Darkstar weapons, it almost seems like they have him on the ropes. That is, until he starts to react to a jewel that Philia picked up back in the Ancient Dragon's Temple and flies away. After a long, strenuous flight just to catch up with Darkstar, we find out that he has arrived at the Fire Dragon Temple. And then, a voice emerges from the darkness. Golden Dragons! Murderers of my race! The Bishi is back, better and edgier than ever. The Supreme Elder, witnessing that he's not good at genocide as he thought, immediately charges at Valgov. <laughs> and does the Supreme Elder have any last minute apologies he wants to make? I take all responsibility. But I never made a mistake. In that case, your very existence is a mistake. 
now be gone. You know what? Not gonna miss him. Apparently, Valgov wasn't absorbed by Darkstar, but fused with them, becoming part dragon, part monster, and part god in one form. And that means him going full JRPG villain in his motives. Valgov and Darkstar want to end the eternal warfare between gods and monsters, good and evil, and they will destroy all existence and recreate it from scratch if need be. Although he is forgetting another race that would really like to have a say in this. You mind waiting a second, pal? There's no way we're gonna let you do that. Miss Lena! Don't forget, there's an acting representative for humanity here, too. You guys have been trapped for a really long time in some stupid pattern. Doesn't mean we have to die because of it. Staying alive is the most important thing to us humans. Yeah! Valgov questions Lena about why she should care because their lives are so brief and meaningless to both gods and monsters, all while trapping her and her party in a shadow dimension and trying to drain their existence. But Lena sums up the entire main theme of Slayer's Try in one awesome speech. We often make mistakes and we get hurt so easily. But with each mistake, we improve ourselves. And with each wound, we don't want to be hurt again. We keep moving on. We cherish the past, the present, and the future. So we want to keep moving forward. There's no way we'll let you ruin that. We're never going to stop fighting. It means too much to us. Philia realizes that her premonition that humanity was the ultimate balance between darkness beyond twilight and brilliance beyond dawn was true, and that is the key to defeat Valgov and Darkstar. Zelos charges up his most powerful black magic, while Gowrie, Zell, Amelia, and Sirius will for the Darkstar weapons, Aerologos being killed a few minutes ago. And Lena is the one who takes up Galveria to unleash the arrow that will split the heavens apart in the prophecy. All we need now is Philia to cast her most powerful holy magic and... I can't do it! Philia! How can I do that? After what my people did to the ancient dragons, if I kill Valgo... Philia, I know you've gone through a lot right now, but this is not the time nor the place. This moment represents my biggest problem with the writing of Slayer's Try as a whole. So much of it is devoted to reiterating plot points, themes, and character beats that we already know. Isn't this like the third time that Lena has had to snap Philia out of despair with yet another angry yet inspiring speech? This is either a result of padding or a result of writers still not being confident in their work even after everything seems to be coming together. This is my best guess as to what Kanzaka means when he said that he was dissatisfied with the final product. But even with all those problems and creative doubt, this is still a strong finale. Not just for Slayer's Try, but for the original Slayer's Trilogy as well. The climax is explosive in the most literal sense, yes, but it's what happens afterwards that puts the period on this great trilogy. After the battle has been won, the mood is bittersweet. That is, until something floats down from the sky to the battlefield. Philia picks it up and finds out that it is an ancient dragon egg, possibly Valgov reborn. We then cause of the party giving Sirius all of the Darkstar weapons, including Gowrie Sword of Light. Why is Gowrie giving away a family heirloom and his most powerful weapon? Now, Gowrie, are you sure you want to give the Sword of Light to him? It's your family treasure, right? True, but it originally came from the other world. Yeah, I guess that's to be expected with how underwritten he is in this season. And then, that's it. The adventure is over, and we see the Fellowship go their separate ways once again. Only this time, it feels permanent. Like this is the last time we'll ever see these characters again. Throughout the credits, we get an epilogue to what the characters are doing. Philia opening up a jar shop and raising Valgov's egg. Amelia going back to being a princess. Zell going back to being a loner, with some slight ship teasing thrown in. And Lena and Gowrie going back to being adventurers. It might not seem much, but with this additional epilogue, it gives a feeling of finality to this ending. One last goodbye to a group of characters we've known for years. Of course, Kanzaka and team did have plans to do a fourth season, but Lena Seiyu Megumi Hayashibara had scheduling conflicts, and other factors led to this being the final Slayer season until 2008. So, was Slayer's Try a good season of Slayers? Truthfully, yes. I mean, there are some problems here and there, the pacing feels meandering at times, anyone in the main party not named Lena or Philia feel very underwritten, certain plot lines like the first search for the Darkstar weapons don't really go anywhere and are resolved with little fanfare, and the themes of finding the balance between light and darkness can come off as incredibly ham-fisted and repeated ad nauseum. But in spite of everything, it's still a good Slayer story. 
The animation and direction are the strongest they've ever been. The comedy is still on point. Billy is a great addition to the story, in my opinion anyways. And despite a few hiccups, this season did prove that Slayers can handle a story with far grayer morality. Valgov is a tragic villain that remains sympathetic throughout the anime. The Golden Dragons are a good example of how a so-called good race can be capable of great evil. And the Overworlders also serve as a great example of how even people with noble goals can be divided over differences in philosophy. So, I guess you can call Slayer's Try a flawed masterpiece of sorts. It's easy to see why this anime got the reputation it did, and how it became so divisive, and how it still pales in comparison to Next, but you can't dismiss this anime as a weak season, because for everything it does wrong, it does so many more things right. So, we've gone through all three original Slayer seasons of the 90s, and it's going to be a while before we get to Season 4, but that doesn't mean we've run out of Slayer's media to cover. Oh no, there will be plenty more to cover in the future.